welcome to all of you. This is the first Fast Forward program this year, and we are cooperating with the Budapest Classics Film Marathon and also with the Swedish Embassy. And um, then I have two fantastic film producers here tonight, and we think that um, we will tackle the question of what it means to be a film producer. And um, just to get started, I thought we would play a game, and I'll hand out two pieces of paper to each of you, I mean one to each. And I would like you to write me one word on this paper, what you think being a producer means. So this is a surprise task. And um, big, so that everyone would see. You got it. Yeah, we want to show them. I mean, I think it, it really interests me how similarly or differently you define your profession. Um, okay, uh, who wants to go first? I, uh... <laughs> okay, children's nurse <laughs> is one. <laughs> and alliance is the other. Uh, alliance. <laughs> Um, would you like to explain me why you think you were a children's, children's nurse? Oh. <laughs> you no, know, but there, there are many situations during making a film that come up and you wonder, are these people really grown up? Or, or <laughs> why do we bother to spend time on this and this and this? And then I have colleagues that are professional children's nurse who are producers. It's a good thing. And then Alliance? It's, um, it, it, came, it came to my mind uh, as a first word, as for me, producing is really like a, a friendship on a battlefield, like sharing things, like sharing ideas on a battlefield, or share battles, share fears, uh, share obstacles. So for me, this is kind of the most important aspect of the verb, that for cause, you have to be allied with a certain amount of people. If you're lucky, more. If you're less lucky, less. And then you just go to a battle. So nursery and battlefield. <laughs> this is kind of, I think it's similar. <laughs> I thought he wanted to say something. So um, I also noticed by, uh, I know Vicky, but having read about your career, that you have a very diff different start. You come from a certain profession and then become producer, and then Victoria was trained to be a producer, and she went and, and, and made her company and, and, uh, and got, I think, you know, head started into this uh, career. Can you tell us a little bit about how you how you ended up being a, a filmmaker and how you met Bergman and what it meant to you? I used to be on films when from when I was thirteen years old. With my father presented me to a film crew once because he was a writer, and I stayed. He went home and I stayed because I took care of the dog. And the next year they called me, and uh, again there was a dog and children. So could you come? And then the third year I got a film on my own as a script girl. A big film, and I didn't know enough. But the people were nice. And I finished school, and I worked all the time, even during term. So my father had to go to the headmaster and say, What are we going to do with this child? And he, she said, I think we should let our, uh, our daughter to work. Mm. And I had to make ten thamina in the end of everything. The last year, when it was finished, I was 17. And there was a, supposed to be a final lunch. And the car from the studio came in and said, no lunch, come on. And uh, uh, I was presented to the head of the studio who said, this year you're going to work for Ingmar Bergman. I was 17 years old. And I said, why me? And he said, nobody else wants to. <laughs> <laughs> because he had a terrible reputation at that time. He was, he was 
He was 36 years old. He was this thin. His stomach ached constantly. He didn't feel well. So he had a terrible reputation of throwing script girls out of the studio all the time. I don't know where they found all these script girls. But <laughs> <laughs> and um, they told me, if he stares at you, stare back. <laughs> and if he spits at you, spit back. And I thought, what, what, what is this? <laughs> and so I met him, and he stared. And I thought, I, I better stare. <laughs> and then he started with this fantastic laughter. And I said, it will be all right. And left. And it was all right for 30 years. <laughs> and do you remember how you began with Cornell? Or what was the first moment you decided that, oh, this is a guy I want to make a company with? Yeah, I do. But I think, I mean, I mean listening what you what you say, I think when, when uh, you were 13, you knew much more about producing than I did when I finished <laughs> Academy. So for me, it seems that, that you had such a long road in the profession already by the time you actually started. So, so for me, it was a blank, zero knowledge about producing. When I was doing my first I had zero idea, literally. So being a script girl is a very good school. Yeah. Because you sit in the middle of the set, and everybody comes to you. You are like a central sort of. So all the gossip and all the bad things and the good things, and you know it. Because they all come to you, because you are the only one who sits still on that other set. So it's a good school. And it was good when I became a production manager, and the, the carpenters came up to me and said, this and we can't do, do, do this and this and that. And then I could say, yes, you can. <laughs> of course you can. So, so that was a good thing. Yeah, when, when, when I met Cornell, it was uh, uh, basically the fifth day of Film Academy. And again, zero idea of what I'm doing there. Like, I wanted to be a DOP because that seemed like a beautiful profession. And I studied photography and literature. And I had very nice ideas about art. And then someone told me that, okay, but you know, your parents are business people. Yeah, you should do something about it. Okay, okay. And um, when we met, you know, we just had the feeling we need to talk more, and then talk more, and talk more. And basically, we grew up together, so I became a producer for him. Now I'm producing others, mm -hmm. uh, other directors, and I'm very happy to do so. But it was really, we were, we were growing into this together. So, you know, like supporting each other's non-knowledge. <laughs> well, so yeah. it was really, really a common trip. He told me, I think, once that, that you have such a wicked opinion on films. I wouldn't like to talk more with you. That was the first sentence, I think. No. <laughs> yeah. But I, I didn't. Um, can you think of a um, defining moment when you felt that you became a real producer? Because I understand that you were on the road from scripty to production manager and then, and then a producer. And then sometimes people use titles, like I use, yeah, I'm a producer, but you're really not. But then there is the moment when you realize that, oh, I did this, and now that I am, I have earned this title. Do you have any memory of, uh, of that? It was this terrible. This terrible story with Bergman's tax story. Are there any interesting conversations over there? No. no. <laughs> uh, so Bergman disappeared. I was employed by him, and he disappeared to Munich. And But we had to make films anyway in his company. And all he did, he, he was a producer because he <coughs> He said, okay, to the script, and so I'll be the director, and it dis disappeared. <coughs> and him and I, we said, so many millions. That's, that was, is the cost of this film. And then he disappeared, and we, it was a very good school for mm. me, because I had to take the responsibility that a producer would take, or have. But he was in Munich, mm. so I couldn't call him and ask. That was a good school. Yeah, not, not having someone on the other side. No. <laughs> yes. No, 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 I mean, may, may I also have a question? Okay. So what I, what I was thinking when when um, 
before we met, of course, I was reading the, the, the text and interview with you, and, and what I was keep thinking about that that during these many years, the profession itself has changed so much. I mean, so deeply and genuinely changed. I mean, I would say the the whole focus of our profession has changed even yes. uh, since I'm doing it, which is 20 years. And which means that I did a different job 10 years ago and I did a different job 15 years ago. So I guess for you who had such a, such a, a, a long time to really experience it, I, I really wonder that when you started and Art House was basically the benchmark you created and it was something really to, to create and, and live up to, uh, till today when we have Netflix, what we were talking about before. So what, 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 what do you think? That how, how is our profession uh, shaping? I don't, that I, I don't think that I could make a schedule today. That is the big difference. Because it has to be so fast. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't dare to show a director whom I respect such a <coughs> ridiculous scheme. Uh, uh, 30 days, you mean? 30 yeah. days is ridiculous, I mean, if, if you're not only in one room and, and uh, but uh, it's really ridiculous and, and these enormous texts that they have to learn, the actors, and I think it's ridiculous, but it's the only way to do it. I think the whole days ha have changed, not only not only the, the amount of days in shooting, I guess, but uh, also also the pace of financing and the pace of, you know, the amount of time what they can actually spend prepping and talking to actors. Like, uh, what, what Berman said was that it, it's about waiting, like wait, waiting for a moment to happen. And that I think we just don't have, yeah, you're right, we don't have that. No, we don't have that. But, and, uh, it's interesting to see, if you see a new film, and look at the, the, um, the titles in the end of it, I always try to count how many producers, yeah. how many production companies. Mm -hmm. Ridiculous. 10, 15. Mm -hmm. And how could they all have the same opinion about this film that they <laughs> No, they <you> know. <laughs> so uh, it's very, for me, it's very, very strange. But I don't work anymore, so they can have it. <laughs> <laughs> but you've been uh, advising film productions even lately and had tried and helped some of them come about how have that what was your experience with that have you had uh, discussions with uh, with the current uh, filmmakers in sweden did you have do you have any like a, a good story about how differently you saw things and they see things no but i feel so sorry for them because it's so difficult to get the money they have a good script, they have the good best actors. I mean, I tried this this, this fall, last fall, with the system that we had, with three or four people giving up of money from the film institute, because you have to start there. You have to have film institute with you to get to the distributor, to get to so and so and so. And I feel sorry for the directors, because it's, it's a never-ending story, this thing about money. And it, it wasn't like that before, at all. But what interests me, we sometimes talk about this with Vicky, but there are so many more films also, so it's very difficult to get to, to be seen. But at the same time, obviously there's more money, but it's harder to get, and I don't understand. It's, it seems like we're talking, uh, you know, these, these things just don't add up. My experience is that yes, we uh, we've been talked about it that it's it's uh, it's really competitive. So uh, since I've started, like in the, the uh, compared uh, twenty to twenty years ago, for me it feels that it's more competitive in a way that is more difficult to to nurture talent because there are, uh, the amount of project is so is so enormous that uh, when you are nurturing the talent, you really have to show how shiny is that. And it becomes just like, for, for me, it becomes a very difficult job because sometimes that talent is not the shiniest, but it's talent. And sometimes it just, it doesn't go with the tendencies. And sometimes it's just, you know, and, and 
this is this is really getting difficult for me at the moment that that uh, you just have to step on this uh, market and just try to beat them all mm. in a way knowing that uh, your chances are slimmer. You have to believe yeah. all the time. You have to have a strong belief in what you're doing, and that's not so easy always. No, it's not. I know. No. I know. Did you did you do anything when you when you had the feeling you don't really believe in that? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's difficult to do. No, that's that's difficult. You see, I've done so much, so everything wasn't fantastic. Uh, I was with the com with the company, and uh, they the philosophy was we do Tivoli and we do we do art. We get the money from the Tivoli, and so I had to do those films too, but with the same ambition, which is sometimes not so easy. But you have to. I wasn't a freelance as a producer uh, in the end, yes, but I was with company. So then you have to adjust. And what is, what was, what was your, I'm just curious, because when, when you say sometimes you knew it's not going to be good, there is a moment when you feel something is right and something is not right for you. So, you know, obviously when you work with Bergman, so you kind of, you thought about things together, you developed ideas together. But after that, when you started to work with other uh, directors a lot with, how, how did you think? I mean, what was the moment when you feel, okay, this is for me? For me, I, I have great difficulty with this, I have to say. I'm uh, the refusing type of producer, but... We did a film called Christmas Oratorio that I'm very proud of. But I think I read four or five versions. It's, uh, it's uh, built on a book, a Swiss book. And, the, and I said to the director and the writer, don't bother me anymore. I don't want to read one more version. Don't go home. I don't, I don't, I don't want to. And the director, he begged me, just this one. Just, I promise you, I never talk to you again. This one. <laughs> and I read it and I said, yes, it's good. <laughs> and why was it so good? What happened there? And I was absolutely honest. It was very, very good. They changed something, and there, and there, and there. It's a strange business. Um, actually, yeah, the title of this discussion, or somewhere, it appears funny and Alexander, so maybe, maybe we'll ask you a question about that, yeah. too. Yeah. This is um, an eight million US dollar budget film it, from 1982, so that's quite a lot of money. It was very much money. Yeah. And then could you tell a little bit about how how that went, and then what what your role was in that film, and then how you, how you, how what your experience was in making that film? Because probably most of the people have seen it, so we want whatever was behind the scenes. I mean, it's the best thing we ever did and the most complicated thing we ever did. The thing was that when we started it, Bergman said, we can't do it in Sweden. You don't have, we don't have the studio. He was in Munich and Bavaria, you know. And, and uh, we don't have the studios, we don't have the people who can do those dresses and build those sets and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, I am not going to sit in Munich for one and a half, two years. Never. <laughs> we have children and husband and family and uh, never. So I really did everything to prove that we could do it in Sweden. <laughs> One funny thing is, he called. He was sitting in Munich and saw a Hungarian film, and he called me and said, "You go to Hungary and you go around and look at 1850 squares." No. <laughs> so I came to Muffin and they sent me out with one art director and one unit manager perhaps and a driver in a <coughs> car and in the back there was a petrol, a big petrol things there. It was probably life dangerous. And we went to a lot of Hungarian towns and I had a camera and I, you know, 
360 degrees and came home and showed him my this and he said, <laughs> after he said, you will never be a cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we did it in the square near Stockholm where it was written. And we did the whole film in Sweden and in Stockholm. And did I get that right that you found the main character, the boy, the mm -hmm. Uma, you, that it was your... You were read. Yes. <laughs> yes I, I saw a te uh, television program that I didn't know what it was. I mean, it was just children and something looking a little. And suddenly there is a boy who is writing on the blackboard and a camera is in his back and he suddenly turns to the camera and says, oh, those eyes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I didn't know what program it was, I didn't know where it was, nothing, I didn't. So I started to pester people at the television, what is this? And they, they found that it is a program from Lasse Hallström, you know, the Swedish mm -hmm. director who is in Hollywood now. And they were mostly, children were mostly from a music school in Stockholm. So I went to the music school, get the permission to look in all the classrooms. And I went, went in one fifth or sixth, and there he is. <laughs> and there he was. And he made a screen test, and all the children that we tested said, uh, I've, uh, I've uh, crushed a window, or, or things like that. This one came in, comes in with his big eyes and says, I scared grandma to death. Grandma <laughs> <laughs> like that. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Did you always agree on, on very important creative decisions like that? Or well, do you remember any huge dis disagreement? Like I can't really. You see, you could play with him too. <laughs> <laughs> he sent me to Spain to look for a desert. In the television version of Funny and Alexander, it ends with this walk in the desert. Yeah. And my husband and I went for 10 days in a car around the south of Spain, and we found a fantastic uh, flood, dried flood. Flood? Yeah, flood. <laughs> and he is a cameraman, so, a photographer, so he made beautiful shots of this, and he won a big montage. And, uh, and we showed this to him. And he said, perfect. It is exactly what I want. I said, yes, fine. And I thought, I will never go there again. <laughs> I knew that. Why should he go there? Who does? Who hates to go over the road? How should we get 1,000 extras into this thing with the helicopters? Do I have the money for that? And so on and so on. So the whole film went on and it was fine. We were friends. <laughs> and one day I said to him, I'm very, very sorry. It was three weeks to go on the, on the shoot. I'm very, very sorry, Ingmar, but I don't think we have the money for the desert. I said, oh, I'm sorry. He said, big theater, I'll fix it. And on Monday morning, he came back and I fixed it. Happy. So we did it in the studio because he was a fantastic cheater in film, what he could do with a set and, you know. That is an art that I don't see very much of today. He, we had two studios, open doors in between them, <coughs> open doors out in a corridor, 400 extras that came in, camera in the back, came in well, to the camera, quickly out, quickly in the corridor, in again, so it went on forever, sort of, you know. And it was our desert, cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, whatever you felt would, it would be right, that was happened at the end of the day. Yes, sometimes, yes. Most yeah. of the time, yeah. We had a wonderful relationship in the, in the, in the end. In the end of those 30 years, it was unbelievable, I mean, really. Do you also remember any such saving money on the steam or on the, what did you, I'm sure you do, but uh, I think that the, the true thing is that I'm not the 
the saving type. <laughs> so, so the thing that, that I'm very easy to be convinced that something is really important, and then I have to think, okay, I have to just, you know, I have to make it. Like the last uh, last discussion we had was uh, about uh, shooting on 35 mil or not uh, Jupiter's moon, and and I knew that. Cornell is mature enough to know that he can make it differently. So he was not really insisting. He, he, he knew it would be a budget issue. He knew that there are many other things we need to put the money on. And like one week before before the shooting, I just went, went, went in and I did some work uh, with the budget. And then I said to him, OK, I cut this into half. You lose half day here. You just uh, reposition this set. I'm losing half of company fee. And we are going 35. And I said, Does it really make sense for you? And I said, Yeah, we, we are going 35. So there, at one point, I just, I, I'm even crazier than, than a director <laughs> would be, which is not really good. But of course, when 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 it's about um, when it's about compromises, I I I like if the compromise makes sense uh, for the screen, and I hate to feel that it was a only a budget compromise. So I like mm -hmm. I like more what you said that I kind of manipulate the whole thing. So it's not only about money, but also about uh, the content of it. It feels it feels better that way. But of course, you know, I mean, limits are limits. When 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 you know the hurting thing, I think when when you are a producer is that you have to make um, decisions and calls which are not uh, necessarily in line with the director's call. And and of course, then you have to you have to work together on that call as well. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when you decided, I was wondering that that when you decided uh, to cut a film version out of Fanny and Alexander because it was created for a, a, as a mini series, like five five of them. Five, yeah. yeah, five hours. So when you when you made that decision, I mean. Were you, were you there during re-editing, or were like because this this had to be a painful re-edit? I mean, I mean, I'm not even saying re-edit, but like the editing of the of the film version lost a lot of. I saw the series as well, so lost l a lot of the core values as well. Fantastic scenes. Fantastic scenes, exactly. Yeah. Fantastic scenes. So that that's like really chopping your your hand. You see, we, we had a contract on a movie version. Yeah. Okay. So you had a contract. And this, this was my Absolutely. question. Two versions. Yeah. But the thing was that when he ran the movie version, he was in shock because it was too long. Still. So we saw. I don't know how many versions we looked at. Uh, to see because he tried to shorten it. You see, it was. I don't remember now. Well over three yeah. hours, and it's really two fifty. I don't remember. But we he had to take away a lot. And that was a that, and he almost got sick that he counted so wrong. You see, he couldn't. He thought this I can do, but then he couldn't, and uh, it was a difficult procedure for him. Uh, it is difficult. Mm -hmm. I remember once when we had to re-edit one of our features, mm -hmm. and uh, we've been sitting, and we were both very sick with uh, with Cornell, with the director. Pleasant days, our second feature. We had very little idea that we had both 40 degrees uh, uh, fever because we were super sick, but we had to be in Paris and we had to finish and we had to re edit. <coughs> so we were sitting on the floor so sick, and then Corner was Corner is really sharp when it comes to losing things, so he, he did it in a very economic way. And I started to cry. <laughs> and he said, no, no, What's wrong? And I said, I don't want to lose that image. And he said, You know, we won't put back an image just because you are crying. <laughs> and I said, Yeah, yeah, I understand. Huh? But would you please put back this image? So we were, but, you know, obviously, because I was so sick. And uh, then, of course, he put that back image. And like one week later, he convinced me that you don't need that. I don't oh. need that. <laughs> so, but for, for that day, I could, I could have my image back. Mm -hmm. Mm. What I really liked about um, this conversation is that when I asked you about the defining moment in your careers, you were not talking about prizes or awards, but you were talking about uh, a real defining moment when you when you felt that you were who you are. So 
But I think it's very interesting that you're in a profession where awards and ceremonies are also always on the you know on the discussion, and and yet here I'm sitting with two people who who actually did not even mention that this film won that and that film won another award. But you, I guess so. I mean, that's what I would like to hear from you. <laughs> I've been to two Oscars. Pretty boring, I could say. <laughs> it's long as it's three or four hours. It never ends. But if you get a prize, fine. You're happy for a night. But I mean, it's that's not the most important. The most important thing is that people like what you've done. I, I mean, we, we, we are talking about way less prices on my end, of course. But the thing is that it's not. It's not even that it's not important, but it's not even on your radar, in a way. It's no. just, I would say that premieres and gala screenings are dreadful. You are, I mean... Because I people are not honest on those gala screenings. Exactly, so right. it's really dreadful, and you are, I'm, I'm always very much afraid of the first screening, because you are honestly terrified what people and press and whoever are going to say, so you are really scared and very vulnerable in a way, so I th these are the worst moments of our profession, I would say. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. true. But don't you think that some of the uh, younger filmmakers, are s you know, the benchmark is very high for them, and, and they don't really understand that this is a process, and you may get there, you may not get there, you must like what you do, and you may not get an award. For Bergman, it meant very much, because he had shown uh, seven seed, the script for the head of the company. And they said, oh no, it's too boring, it's too slow, it's too boring, forget it. And then he got the humor prize in, some prize I never heard about the year, in Cannes for Smart of the Summer Night. Mm. And he didn't even know that they had the film down there. He was sitting in his home. So he borrowed money from B.B. Anderson, who was rich at the time, and he was very poor, and flew down to Cannes with the script, and went up to, to this man, the head of the company, and said, and now? <laughs> and they had to give in, you see. But we only got 35 days to do it, and very little money. But he did it, and it was, it's funny, because it's one of his most famous films. And I have seen it again now, and it's a fantastic film. I recommend it. Do you, do you remember what was the, the phone call or the first sentence was what uh, Berman said to you when when um, he figured out that Fanny and Alexander would be the next one? I mean, these first sentences are always so curious, you know, when you get a call like, I know what's next. We're going to do it. <laughs> and it had been a discussion about it. So I knew so what it was on the table already. Yeah, but it, the, the money wasn't there. So it, they skipped it. So when he said that, I knew exactly what we were talking about. And we were doing the last film of a, f of a day, or the last day of a film of <coughs> Gunnelin Bloom, one of his actresses, directing her first, second film, something. And I smoked absolutely all the cigarettes I could at the end <laughs> party that night. And because I knew that two hours with Ingmar intimately like that, he can't have me smoking. So I stopped smoking. And that's how it started. And then two days later, I went to the island where he lived with big papers like this, you know, with all the actors, and, you know. That was, was before. Uh, computer time. And we sat till two at night. And it's one of the most wonderful nights of my life. Because he was so enthusiastic and we we cast it and we decided a lot of things. It was wonderful. We didn't have casting directors at that time. <laughs> so you made the entire casting by yourself basically the two of you or the three of you with with uh, Nicholas? Cast Nicholas doesn't cast. No. 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 <laughs> he makes film. He makes photographs. No, no custom. Mm -hmm. And I 
think we can't have a program on the classic film without mentioning Tarkovsky, who you also work with. And um, you, you told us a funny story this uh, today at the lunch. Uh, I would really like to hear it again, but if you have any other um, in memories uh, on working with Tarkovsky, we'd appreciate it. But that one is so typical for him. So you should say, yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> it was the first, he, he was going to do a film in Sweden that unfortunately it became his last film, and it was called Sacrificio, Sacrifice. And it started, the first day of shooting was in the winter. It was only one day, one scene, one take in a castle, a couple of miles out of Stockholm. And I was there and I saw that the first slate was done and I went home to the office. And they didn't come in. I was sitting there alone and I said, what are they doing? And at nine o'clock at night, uh, the crew came in and I said, what? What is this? Why? You see, Andre didn't want us to, he wanted us to shovel, shovel, shovel the snow by hand from the very <coughs> front of this castle. And I knew this was a big farm, so I said, what about the tractor? <laughs> no, 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 he didn't want that. And you just did, yes, we did what he wanted. So next morning I see him and I said, why? What are you thinking? Well, he was so surprised. He didn't want to do anything bad to me. He said, but people don't cost anything, but machines are very expensive. <laughs> but he had, he had not so much respect for our work. I have one for him. There is a scene in the film where a lot of people, half naked, are running down to stairs. And we had it all prepared in the old town of Stockholm. Police, 400 extras, where to change clothes and where to keep all the money and so on. And food and, and police uh, to cut off the street and everything done. This was going to be on a Wednesday. On Monday morning, he comes in to me happy in the office and says, um, I have found another place. <laughs> I said, you must be joking. It's too late. It was a very good place, yes, but yeah, no problem, you fix it, he said, and left. <laughs> and you fixed it? Yeah, I didn't do it alone, by, really, but uh, with me and my crew, we fixed it somehow. And the strange thing is that that was the corner, this is the middle of Stockholm, uh, that was the corner where Olof Palme was shot half a year later. It's very strange, I think. It is. It is, um, I don't know. It is. But uh, two days, you fix it, left. <laughs> Um, also, I was thinking about children's nurse and, and war, or alliance, and, um, and I, the, the word that keeps coming back to my mind is responsibility, that I think that both of you, obviously producers, must, must be very responsible people, and that I'm wondering how you can carry that with you throughout uh, film production, which you know, from the first day of the phone call <coughs> with the, with the um, uh, uh, director to the last day or um, the screening of the film. How do you cope with that? And if uh, you have uh, alliances in that, who are your partners? Who, you, who, who did you have to go back to when, when you, <coughs> you couldn't solve something? If you remember any, any uh, situation when there was just no solution? No, but it's, if you have done films before, you know this responsibility, and you, it's no argument about it. You're responsible and that's it. Otherwise, go home and do something else. We have often talked about selling milk with the way they did milk in the old days, but we never did that. But, so, it's a responsibility you have grown into, I would say, in my case. I never said, I'm going to be a producer. Never, never, never. It seems has happened by the years, and there are many years. Yeah, it, it is true that it's, it's heavy, 
but <coughs> I, I would say I, I enjoy that. So I, I tend to enjoy responsibility. <coughs> most probably because you grow into that, but in a way I have, I always have the feeling that even when I'm not producing that you, you become someone who, who has to act for things. <coughs> so my husband uh, makes a joke a lot of time out of it that you know don't produce <laughs> this. This is only a dinner. So 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 you tend to be uh, a person who, who takes more responsibility on you because it's so it's so obvious. <coughs> so it's so Sorry. obvious. For you. you you just have to. And also for the people. And once Cornell told me that. Uh, uh, I was disappointed after a, a, a scene or after a situation or a premiere, I don't know, but I was kind of disappointed and down. And mo most of the times I encourage directors and, and authors around me and I never really show when I'm disappointed, but I was disappointed at that point, I was just sitting like this. And then Cornel just told me that, that we can't be down in the same time. <laughs> so whether I'm up and you're down, or whether I'm down and you're up, so we just can't be down at the same time. But yeah, this is responsibility. When there are people around you who know exactly when when to help you. And of course, you know, I, I have a great team of people also, so it's not all me. I want to say something about producers or production people's task, really. It's all about helping the director to do his vision. I think that's that's the job. And then it's economy and all kinds of nonsense, but that's the main thing. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. But that that's what gets more and more difficult, I think, with, with the time. I mean, I, at least, you know, how, how I... Uh, I have a view on today's market, and this this is getting more and more difficult for me. That I would really like to support visions, but then I question myself more and more: Is it a vision that <coughs> others will appreciate, or is it just a vision that I will appreciate? So, I think it's uh, it's getting down. Um, do you have, do you have to trust them? Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but questioning yourself is a process. You know? I'm wondering if time does. I think. That's the other thing besides uh, responsibility, that time is an issue. And you mentioned that this uh, this profession has, uh, and our whole world has sped up. It's just much faster. Everything you need to decide fast, and and maybe that's the kind of time you don't have for nurturing talent, or you question it immediately because you don't have that much time. I don't know how you how you tackle that. And then if you follow today's cinematography, if you have anyone who you appreciate from today's authors, European filmmakers, or anyone you think that uh, you know, we should all watch, if, uh, I would appreciate no, I can't answer that. It's, uh, it's a lot. I mean, it's, uh, it's always something. Always somebody new or somebody old that has done something wonderful again. And it's a difficult question, I think. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I watch, I think, way, way uh, too many TV series <laughs> lately, so it yeah. might be, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lot. I think something interesting is happening there, so I can recommend a few. <laughs> no. no, it's a difficult question. Okay, I was really wondering if you're following today's talents, if you're, you know, the younger generation of filmmakers, because I know that you do, because you have to, you don't have a choice, but I'm wondering if anything interests you today, is this, you know, is there a topic that, that you think, now this is really interesting, I'm really happy that this person did this film, or... Yeah, it can yeah. happen, it can happen, not so often anymore, I must say, but I'm getting more and more critical, and why do they? Why do they have to do this film and so on? But it happens. It happens absolutely, and I'm very happy when it happens. Of course. And if you would have to give a good advice to anyone who is sitting in film school today, I'm sure there are some people here who are uh, film students. What would it be? I know what you would say. Yeah. Work hard. <laughs> Everything. We had a director uh, in in Sweden. He was quite talented, but he he 
the, the crew hated him because he said so many stupid things. And <laughs> so he went to Bergman and said, what, 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 what do I do wrong? What shall I do? And Bergman said, learn everything. <laughs> and then this one thought he did learn everything, then it got worse. Yes. But, that's, but that is a good... You have to know something about filmmaking practically. Bergman was incredible in this. He knew everything. He felt that lamp was wrong. And it wasn't the same as yesterday. I mean, things like that. He was, he was really fantastic that way. But to learn filmmaking from the ground, from the practical way, from the technical way, and then life gets more easy. True. <laughs> I always, I always tend to say to, to I, I teach few people at the academy, and, and uh, it comes to the last class of the year, and I kind of try to be supportive, and and uh, you know I always try to encourage them with saying that it gets better every day. It's just like nurturing a child. It, it just gets better every day, in a way. And uh, I heard once someone told me that you know you have to break tendencies. And I said that you know you don't have to break tendencies. I mean you, you have to break your own tendencies at one point. So so I think this this I would like to achieve myself always. And I remind myself that that is the the tendencies you create. It's good to break time by time. So it's otherwise you get boring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you have to lie to be good. <laughs> I mean, to encourage. Most of these people, if we're talking about directors and actors, they are mostly very insecure people, and especially actors. You have to to get the best result out of the actors, you have to be nice. Take care of them, trust, uh, all these things. I mean, to be an actor, I don't know why I'm talking about actors suddenly, but I, <laughs> to be an actor is more or less to be naked in front of the camera. And this is true, I mean, not naked, naked, but naked. You know. Yeah. And if they have a director that sits on the other side of the camera or by the camera who trusts you, then you can do things you never you never thought you were able to. <coughs> but today, here we go again, today when the director sits two hundred meters away looking in a monitor, that certainly doesn't help the actor. <laughs> Be by the camera if you're a director. Trust them. Take what they have to give. And it will be fine. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> this must be like a preacher, woman. Well, yes, yeah, so this is the church of film. Um, actually, we are getting towards the end of this uh, master class. And, but I would like to ask the audience if anyone has a question that we would like to give you the chance to ask. Uh, I would like just uh, to hear something about Nyquist. 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 He is one of the greatest of yes. the 20th century, yes. but uh, from the point of view of the producer, was he, was he a difficult fan because it's uh, or easy to cooperate with him, or how was it? He, he almost didn't use any light. When I came into a room and he had more than four, four or five lights, and I said, "What are you doing, playing Ben Hur?" <laughs> <laughs> no, but he was very modest. I mean, he his first job, international job, I think, it was for Houston, in Spain, and they had brought all the brutes in the world, and Sven didn't use them, and they thought this man can't photograph because he didn't use all this nonsense they had. He was fantastic in many, many senses. I agree. <laughs> I loved him. I loved him, really. He was wonderful. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one. Uh, you were talking before about 
for that. Make us a bit for us, man. I'm Paul Peter. Would you like to stand up? Oh, sorry. Of course, sorry. I'm speaking Hungarian, so it's <laughs> yeah. You were talking about the production taste of today, and uh, I was wondering what are the consequences of the screen? Because you, before you talked about like what the amount the of consequences of the screen, the amount of producers and the stressful working environment, but. For, for the audience, what are the consequences on screen, the visible ones? The worst consequence is for the actors, I think. They don't have time. Yeah. I, I don't know if this is a good answer. I, I'm, but I'm very much for taking care of the actors, and they don't have time with it today. Yeah. In and out of the, of the camera, in and out, quickly, quickly. Yeah, I agree. I think the consequences are with, with the actors. Also with the details, I think. De details, and maybe the acting details, mostly. But uh, it just gets lost uh, easily. And to fix things. So if something is not good, you just, you, know, you just have to do it differently. And I truly hate the moment when you say, OK, we have that. So for example, with Cornell, we just always go back and fix it. I mean, there's no way you say, okay, it's so, so, it's almost okay. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, uh, what is, what is your best feature, what is your best thing in your personality that helped you through the roughest time in your career? And I'm also really curious about the first thing in you, your worst feature, what holds you back at what did you have to find again? Okay. Okay. Uh, what's your best feature with your, uh, what do you think is a strength in between being a producer and what was your worst? I can't answer that. I've, I've been working 125, 150 <laughs> films, I can't tell you that. No, 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 I don't understand like like your um, the personality like personality trait, like if you're, uh, if you, you're confident or if you're insecure. Me? Yes, yeah. if, if, if what was your strength in uh, being a producer and uh, what was something that held you back? Talk to me loyal to the director uh, if possible. And the bad thing? Yeah, something that held you back sometimes that you felt. When I was younger, I had a quiet uh, temper. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm more quiet today, but uh, that could sometimes be some circus. But, uh, but I, I forgot what, why I was angry in five minutes, so it wasn't a big thing. <laughs> Is that an answer? Yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> Can I have a question? I'm just wondering, you know that Bergman had his own uh, family of actors that he often <coughs> used in his films. For example, I'm wondering if, if what kind of relationship he had with the other actors, William Gershon, Josef Erlandsson, Lee Bullman, Lena Ullin, or those other, uh, the other actors. Mostly professional, of course. Mm -hmm. But it was a big <laughs> thing. He was, he was um, working in south of Sweden, in Malmö, on the theatre. And many of these actors also worked with him there. And then in the summer they come, came up to us and made a film. <laughs> so they knew each other so well, and, so, and he knew so well what he could get out of them, what performance they were able to give him. Anyone else? If not, thank you very much for being here. This was a very good conversation, and I hope it will help the students in the rows, and good luck.